turn to God's Word as we find it in the book of Exodus. I'm going to take time to read the whole of chapter 3 this evening, which we've been working our way through. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jephro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. But when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. For I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a pl the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the, and of Isaac, and of Jacob appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. I have said that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice. and You shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go, you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. 
so you shall plunder the Egyptian. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that many have asked through the centuries for you to teach them your way. Lord, so you have done. We Thank you, Lord, that we indeed follow behind a great procession of individuals who have faithfully sought after the way of God and have walked in that path directed by your Spirit. Lord, may you again teach us tonight. Lord, as we stand so far apart from the events in the passage in history, show us, Lord, the relevance of these things to us now. Lord, we may rightly divide the word of truth and it might be rightly applied unto our lives. Lord, we might learn and gain those things which you find necessary for us. Lord, that we might reject those things that are simply the thought of a man's mind and ideas. Thank you, Lord, that you are God and you therefore send forth your Holy Spirit that the weakness of men might be hidden behind the greatness of God that, Lord, we might be granted ears with our hearts to hear what the Spirit has to say unto us. We thank you, Lord, for these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Brave words indeed, but Moses said to God. God's plan here is questioned. But Moses was a man at this very moment afraid to look upon God. The burning bush is before him. The flame of fire is in its midst. The bush is not consumed. He hears the voice of God coming from the bush. He has already spoken to Moses. But Moses has questions about what he has heard. God has revealed his purpose. God is aware the children of Israel have been oppressed. He has seen that oppression. Moses is told in these verses we're considering this evening... When you go, go and tell them, I've seen these things. I've been amongst you. God had also told Moses he would deliver them out from Egypt and bring them into Canaan. God intended at the end of those verses that we considered last time, he said to Moses, come and I will send you to Pharaoh. He intended to commission Moses as his ambassador before Pharaoh. Now the man who is still quaking in, well, he's not got his shoes on, so it's not his shoes that he's quaking in, but certainly his clothes. He quakes upon the dust, afraid to look upon God, is heard speaking as Moses questions God's plan. Like Moses, we tonight might have a proper respect and awe of God. Some of us have been privileged to stand in some very beautiful places in this world and we have been lost with wonder at the creation that God has made. Some of us have been privileged to stand in places where there's no man-made light or very little of it and look up at the heavens and see the stars and we have lost our breath as it were, wondering at the glory of those things. But many more of us have been in a meeting such as this where the word of God has been opened and we have known God's presence. And we might have a proper awe and respect of God. And yet, as we look at the apparent purpose of God in our lives or for our lives at any point, we may find ourselves wanting to ask God a question or two, similar to the questions that Moses had about God's plan. Knowing this, we don't just read here in this passage about the questions that Moses has for God, but God's own response as God's answer to the questioning of his plan. To put it under two headings, we see for Moses, God gives his clarification. And for ourselves, we can make our own observation of the things that are set before us here. When I say our own observation, please take that as led by what is within the Word, not to come to it and make up our own idea or mind of what we would be thinking about. So first, God's clarification. I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you. They were the words in verse 12 to Moses from God. But it began with Moses questioning God's choice. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses' first response to God's plan to commission him as an ambassador before Pharaoh is to say, You've got the wrong man. 
I'm really not the person for the job. That's what he would like to put across in this moment. Now, don't mistake Moses here. We know from later testimony, Moses was known to be a humble man. And partly, part of that humility that is in him may well have developed from the experiences of his life. He was a nobody who was brought into the palace of the king of Egypt. Being brought up there, he was brought up in a place of privilege. But when he came of age, he turned his back upon these things and went out to his own people, the Hebrews. But he found no acceptance among them and was caused to flee. He is now a shepherd at the backside of the desert, looking after his father-in-law's sheep. He could not see himself in the position God had chosen for him. Just couldn't put the things together. An ambassador, deliverer of the children of Israel. That's a long way from where I stand here or kneel here in your presence, God. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And yet, God knows exactly what he's doing. Here is a man who may be humble about who he is, but he's confident enough about his relation to God to speak to God. On his knees, in the dirt, he raises his voice to question the plan of God. God answers Moses with a promise. So God said to him, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Two things within that. Moses would not be alone. God was going with him. He would be with him. And further, God had a great privilege prepared for Moses far greater than standing before Pharaoh and bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. He would serve God personally. The writer of the Hebrews tells us that Moses fled Egypt looking to the reward of God. He wanted to know God. God made Moses a promise. You will come back here. and You will serve me on this mountain. Second thing Moses questioned was God's name. Moses said to God, Indeed, when I have come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses, in part, seems to accept, and rightly so, that he's going to have to go, even though he's still going to go on to say how unsuited he is to the task in later verses. But he will have to go. But how will I introduce God in a way that the children of Israel will believe? How will the children of Israel know that it's really God who's met with Moses? Surely anyone could turn up and say, well, God has said to me, and you ought to listen. How how will they really know? Moses' question is answered with God's clarity. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, although this is God's first introduction, and it is a famous introduction of God's within his word, of himself in this way, in truth, it is the same way as God has introduced himself from the beginning. We're reading an English translation. But in the Hebrew, the phrase, I am who I am, sounds very similar to the name that is translated in English, Jehovah, the God. And God wanted to introduce himself, and Moses to introduce himself, not with a new name, but with the fact that he is, and there is no other. I am God, and there isn't anyone else. They shouldn't be asking for any other name. There is no other name. I am God. Therefore, God tells Moses to introduce him just in the same way as God introduced himself to Moses. Instead of introducing God, uh, God being introduced as the God of Moses' father, introduce me as the God of your fathers. 
and the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Introduce me in the same way as you, I introduced myself to you. The phrases are the same use. Further, he says, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations, not just now, but throughout all time. This is how I reveal myself. In essence, God tells Moses, his name is set in stone. That's what a memorial is, isn't it? A piece of stone or, or some permanent structure imprinted with it. This is my memorial. For all generations, I am who I am. God, that is me. Then Moses questioned the difficulty. Well, you say, I don't see the question on the page. Quite right. Although Moses doesn't verbally ask the question, it's evident that there must be a question because God gives the answer to it. The question within the man. God knew full well Moses had lived in Egypt. It was God who appointed Pharaoh's daughter to draw him out of the water. It was God who watched over his steps as he fled the land of Egypt, choosing to live away from the place of his birth and seeking the hand of God in his life. God knew all about Moses' past. He knew about all the things that would be upon Moses' mind as a result of these things, the difficulties that would be entering into his mind. We find that God answers Moses realistically. Moses was to go to the elders of the children of Israel and tell them God's plan. God informed Moses that when he did this, that they would indeed heed him. And together they would go before Pharaoh. Moses would speak before Pharaoh. He would use words like these, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. Regarding the difficulties, now that Moses is thinking, well, that message is going to go down well, God answers. God agrees that Pharaoh is not going to let these people go. Even when the mighty hand of God is revealed, he will not let you go. Therefore, God will stretch out his hand and he will strike Egypt with all his wonders. If you've read ahead, you know there are ten plagues that will come. Moses is told this is going to take place. And after this, Pharaoh will let you go. Don't think the children of Israel are going to come out of Egypt and And just be bereft, but they'll just be fleeing for their lives? No. The children of Israel would not leave empty-handed. God would cause them to plunder the Egyptians of as much silver, gold, and clothing as they and their children could carry. They would plunder the Egyptians. There's another little phrase in the midst of all of that. The Israelites have been placed in the land of Goshen. And they had been pretty much kept apart, it seems, from the people of Egypt, lest the people of Egypt should be made unclean and or vice versa. God speaks that these people, the Egyptians, would be living amongst the children of Israel at this time. And we find that to be the case later on because God made a division in the later plagues. But he didn't bring them upon the children of Israel, but only upon the Egyptians. So the Egyptians decided the safer place to be with the children of Israel. So God told Moses realistically what he planned to do. Because Moses would have the questions that we would have had if we'd have been in his situation. Which brings us then to the observation that we make in the light of these things. For God's clarification comes as Moses questioned the plan of God, and God has plans for our lives. We are told statements like we find in the book of Jeremiah that God has plans to uh, do us good and not to do us harm. Uh, We are told in other places that the way that God has worked out for our lives before there was a day uh, of my life, God knew it all together. He had it all fashioned. But As we come and become aware in parts of the plan of God in our lives, we may make our observations and want to ask our own questions. What about your choice, God? Moses said, who am I? 
And we might feel like telling God in the light of what we're facing, you've got the wrong person. I really can't do this. I am not fitted. And you might not be, you might be like Moses in this. It's not a case that you're being deliberately rebellious, but simply facing the fact of of who you are. I'm not important. I'm not accepted. We might have good reasons for thinking these things. We might be like Moses. He could have used various excuses or various reasons. He may have felt that he had failed God in the past. The Scriptures make it clear that's not the way to be viewing Moses. But if we were looking at it just from Exodus, we might think that was the case. You know, I I lost my temper there, and and I didn't handle things as well as I could have done. And there were surely events in his life that are not recorded in Scripture, if he's anything like us, that he could have said that. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be very good at this. I failed in the past. We might feel that we wouldn't be accepted by those that God asks us to go and help. The Egyptians are not going to be keen to see Moses when they work out who he is. And the children of Israel hardly rolled out the red carpet when he appeared to help them. Who made you a judge over us? We might feel that with God when we have God saying to us and feel that we are being led in some task. Well, you know, I, I don't think I'll be accepted very well. We may feel ill-equipped for the task that God has planned. We may have spent the last 40 years of our life wandering the backside of the desert looking after sheep, and it doesn't really feel that we should be an ambassador for God before Pharaoh. The last time we wore clothes suitable for that task was too long ago, and we weren't, didn't feel really up to the job then, so why would God want to use me now? Yet there's something here in this passage where everybody who asks that question, knowing who God is, is in the same position as Moses. Oh, there's not a bush in front of you with the flame of fire in the midst of it and God speaking out of it, but you are talking to God. You can't send me to Pharaoh, but I'm quite happy to tell you, God, that you've got the wrong person. Which is the most scary out of those two? There's no comparison, is there? Pharaoh could destroy Moses' body. Jesus says, do not fear him, it can only destroy the body. Fear him who could destroy both your soul and your whole being in hell. It's a wonderful thing that God should be so patient with us as to listen when we have our questions. But God has the same answer for us as he had to Moses. He answers with promises. He said to Moses, I will certainly be with you. And that's the same promise he gives to all his children when he asks them to do something. As with Moses, those who God appoints, God promises he will be with them. Jesus said to his disciples when he was leaving them, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And even more encouraging for us is to read in John 17 of the Lord's high priestly prayer where he says these wonderful words for us in this day and age, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That means us. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in one in us, and that the world may believe that you have you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. He's given us a wonderful promise. Whatever he asks us to do, however unfit we feel to do it, God has said, I will be with you. Of course, Moses was given a sign. But we have been given a sign. John 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you for myself, that where I am, you may be also. You say, well, that's just for the disciples. No. Jesus prays again in John 17, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, 
and they may behold my glory with which you've given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. That's verse 24 of John 17, and the verses I read previously are verses 20 to 23. So when Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word, he is including us in the verse there where he says, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me. Whatever he takes us through, it's not to go to Egypt and be a deliverer of the people out of Egypt, but whatever he calls us to, he says, I will be with you. And here's a sign for you. You will be with me where I am. You won't serve on a mountain, but in the very presence of God himself. God has the same promises. The application of the word, the timing of the word and the revelation is later, earlier for Moses, before Christ, but it's the same person addressing him through that bush. We may also question the relevance of God's name. Then Moses said, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say, what is his name, what shall I say? Like Moses, we may ask, well, how can I introduce God in a way that they will believe? How will people know it's really God who has met with me? So you feel that God is asking you to witness to an individual, and they have never been in church to your knowledge. They have little knowledge of anything to do with the Bible. Uh, any Christian they've met is probably just you. How will I introduce God in a way that is relevant to them, that they will understand what I mean and they will believe it? Well, God's answer that God gave to Moses is the same today. I am who I am. God is the same as he's always been. He doesn't come up with a new name every century. He has one name, but it has given multiple expressions that we can understand the different ways that God reveals himself. He is almighty, he is the all-knowing, and all these things. But at the end of the day, he's God. He is the divine one. And when we're thinking of how we will introduce God, we have to remember that he is also the same as people know him to be. Say, well, they've never been introduced to the things of Christ. No, that doesn't mean they don't know God. Romans 1 and verses 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. And God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. They might say you've not introduced him very well, but they're wrong. God is God. The essence of God's name is set in stone. We are not to play around with it, and we don't need to. We can simply introduce God as God. You say, well, there's lots of names of God used by different peoples. That's not God. Allah is not God. The expressions of God in other religions, that's not God. God is God. The creator and sustainer of all things, the only savior of mankind, through the Lord Jesus Christ, his beloved son, who sent forth the Holy Spirit unto us all. This is God. Introduce him as God. Third thing we have in common with Moses, we may have our questions regarding the difficulties of God's plan. Well, God, you don't know what it's like for me now. You don't know what it's going to be. I know these people. Moses would think of the problems he'd had with Pharaoh maybe in the past. He'd seen the way the government worked there. He'd thought about all the things that he might come up against and do, and if he wasn't thinking about them, he was already had it in mind. When God tells us and God begins to reveal what he wants to do, well, we find all the difficulties we can imagine and we put them in the way. God doesn't wait for us to ask the questions. He gives us the answer. Like Moses, we need to know that God's plans are not unrealistic. God doesn't call a person and say, oh, it's all going to be wonderful, you know. It's going to be great. 
You look how Moses' life panned out once he left Egypt. It weren't great. The hard life. You look at any of the prophets and any of those who served God, it was not an easy life. But it was a realistic life. God knows what he's asking you to do. He knows what he's asking you to do as a parent. He knows what he's asking you to do as an employee, as a retired person, whatever stage of life. He knows what he's asking you to do when he asks you to witness or to live your life before a dying world that needs to know Christ. He knows what he's asking you to do. And he also knows those who will stand with us as we obey. It's a wonderful thing to read through Paul's letters and look for those who came to stand with him. And when everyone else forsook Paul, it was the Lord who stood by him. God knows who will stand by us when we obey him. God knows the reception we will receive. At first, we might receive a good reception from those who will go and stand with us, but it won't always be the case. There will be a rejection to the message of God. God ultimately will complete his plan by his own strength and his own provision. Moses is the ambassador, but he is just a man. God is going with him. The might of his arm will be demonstrated. Every word that Moses is asked to speak, God will fulfill. God will bring his people out. Whatever God has called us to do, however many difficulties we might put in the way, it is best if we trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, as the hymn writer said, than to trust and obey. God is realistic. Remember what he said to Paul in the light of that need of realism. My grace is sufficient for you. and My strength is made perfect in weakness. Moses would become known as the meekest man in all the earth. It's a good testimony. It didn't mean he was weak. He knew his strength and power was in the arm of God, but that was for later days. At this point, he listened to the answer of God. It was realistic. We accept the realisticness of God's answer to us. So we've seen that Moses questioned God's plan, and we've seen the clarification that God gave to those questions. We've observed in the light of those things God's answer to the questioning of his plan, and we can put those across our own lives in whatever our circumstances are and, and know that these are the ways that God reveals to us. But is it enough that has been said? I am who I am. It should be. In the beginning was the heavens and the earth. They were without form and void. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. From absolutely nothing came light. Nothing did exactly what God asked it to do. It brought forth light. Not just an attempt, but it brought it forward perfectly according to the standards and knowledge of the God who had spoken it into being. When he said, let there be light, nothing knew exactly what God meant. And it provided all that he asked for. And God said, it's good. In the light of the words of Scripture, the same God, I am who I am, here in Exodus, as in Genesis 1. Do we really think that something, even our own thoughts, will be enough to disrupt God's plan any more than nothing could? Of course we can't. God's plans are going to be accomplished. Therefore, although we may have all the questions in the world about what God purposes for our lives, God has revealed sufficient to us that we should trust and obey. I am who I am. God is who he is, as he declares. What else can we ask? What else do we need? Enough has been said, has it not? I am who I am. Moses was at the bush. 
He's afraid to look up, but he's been able to ask his questions. When he gets up in a little while, he will go back to Egypt. He will learn what God meant when he said, I am who I am. You may not have all the answers to your questions as you would like them out of this passage tonight. When you get up and you go home and you go back into your life, God has said enough and he goes with you. I am who I am. Pray. Lord God, we thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you, Lord, that it is true. Lord, these things took place. We can read to the end of the account of Moses' life and see every word fulfilled that you spoke unto him and all that you accomplished. Lord, we thank you. We don't have to just finish with Moses. We can read from Genesis to Revelation and see that I am who I am has accomplished all these things. We thank you, Lord, that we can know tonight that your plans and purposes will be accomplished in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we have a God in heaven who is humble to listen to our questions. He doesn't consume us on the spot when we ask silly things of him, but compassionately gives us answers we can understand. But Lord, also, you bring us to the point where we have to trust you by faith. You have said, Lord, you will be with us, you will not forsake us, and We can only prove that tomorrow and tonight as we go forward into the coming hours. We can't prove that by staying right here where we are. Lord, we can't prove that you're going to accomplish your plan by simply sitting back and thinking it's going to happen. We have to go forward with you. So, Lord, help us to go forward. Help us to trust in the simple declaration to others around us that you are God. There is none other. Lord, we're not speaking about a God who can be compared to any other in this world. For there is no other. All the others are an imagination of men. We have in our hands and our Bibles the declaration of God and his word. Lord, may you reveal yourself as the God who is to them through us. Lord, may we prove that all our strength is in God's might. All our salvation is in God's hand. That everything that we are is all drawn from God. Lord, may you make us all that you want us to be in this life. And Lord, we look forward to the accomplishment of all the fruition of everything you have purposed for us in the eternal life. And we will be no less dependent upon the one who is who he is. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.